Coming up on the season premiere of the Tiger Football Report, we'll be joined once again with the head coach of the Tigers, Rob Ambrose. We'll talk with Coach Ambrose about the Tigers' first opponent, Central Connecticut State, and later we'll spotlight some of the few key players that the Tigers could expect big things from. Sit tight, the Tiger Football Report starts right now. Hello Tiger fans and welcome to the Season 2 premiere of the Tiger Football Report. I'm the voice of the Tiger, Spiro Marikas, and it is great to be back in the studio talking football. There's a definite buzz in the air surrounding the 2014 Tiger football team, especially after that magical run that was last season. But that was last season, and as great as it was, it's over, and it's time to put the sights on Central Connecticut State. Let's now bring in the man who leads the Tigers football team, Rob Ambrose, and coach this Spring ball, summer ball, a little bit different than your first four years because you guys played in the January, so the, the time frame wasn't quite as long as normal. <laughs> no, the turnaround time was extremely short. As a matter of fact, most of us felt like we never stopped playing. At, uh, we got off the bus, got off the plane, got off the bus, and uh, went recruiting. And when that was over, the guys were back, and we were doing it again. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been different. Uh, it's been fun but it's still been a long time. And uh, I, did, I had this discussion with a reporter the other day. We need to play a football game. I said, the best funny joke of a commercial I've seen, I don't want to make fun because I love the Orioles, but this is Major League Baseball because you got to do something until football season. And at least we got great baseball around here, but uh, chopping at the bit. Yeah, I, I feel like it's been three years since we played a game and we need to get some work in. How much did that long season make you have to adjust what you do going into spring and coming out of spring going into training camp? It wasn't necessarily the time frame that was the challenge in moving forward. It was the sheer mass number of the exodus of players who left, most of them starters, that when we showed up in helmets in the spring, we were looking around like, where is everybody? Like they all left. And that was the biggest adjustment. And that, that along with some injuries from last season, uh, we went through spring practice with six linemen, offensive linemen that could play, which was a challenge for organization practice. But uh, we've been grinding through it pretty good. We've added some new bodies, some, some new fine additions to the future. But, uh, yeah, it was quite a challenge. For you now, you came here um, before the 2009 season, and you basically had to start from scratch, you know, bring in your own system, bring in your own coaches. Then you get to the point where last year you had a very veteran ball club. Does this – training camp, has it seemed more like 2009 than say 2012 or 2013? No, more like 11 okay. and, and better than 11. In 11 there were so many unknowns that we, have, we had worked and built and we knew we had built something, something different and something that we felt was a little bit better but it was yet to be tested against somebody else. In this, the defense the defense has really been growing for the last three years, and it's gotten better and better and better. And the stuff that I'm seeing in practice right now is really, really impressive. I feel really good about where we are on defense, and I couldn't have said that in 11. I thought that would have been a question mark. I feel really good about where we are on special teams, and I couldn't have said that in 11 either. Another question mark. Offensively, it seems very much like 11. There's a lot of talent there, but it's so young. When you graduate all five linemen pretty much, and the tight end, and the tailback, and the quarterback, and a wideout, you know, there's like, now, we've recruited well. I'm, I'm extremely pleased about these guys, but they're not battle-tested, and they're younger. You know, if you, if you go back to, the, to 2011, that offensive line that did so many great things, they were all babies. They were sophomores, and they had already been through a year of just, they went through a 1-10 in 10 season, and they went through a 1-10 in 10 season of living it, of getting hit in the face week after week and getting a little bit embarrassed. These guys, all they've seen is the legacy left before them of guys that were winning. They haven't had to suffer through losses yet. And the goal is to try to get them to that level without the same suffering. For you and your staff, you, you mentioned defensively. You've got, you've got some young guys, but you've got some veteran guys there. The offense, as you say, is basically almost brand new. Does it, how do you adjust for practices and what you do as opposed to what you would have done last year? Because obviously you're going to have to teach more now mm -hmm. than you did last season. We put more installs in during the you know, walk-and-talk periods instead of just go get them. 
So that, there was some of that. But it's not like these guys haven't learned. It's not like we just gave them a new system to learn. They've been watching and learning and being involved. Where we've gotten the crash course has been try, try being a redshirt freshman or a sophomore offensive tackle blocking Ryan Dallaire. If that doesn't get you a little prepared for what you're going to see in conference play, I don't know what will. Kind of like last year, the, your defense had to practice against Terrence West every day. <laughs> well, they had to, you know, Ryan Dallaire had to practice against Eric Pike and Randall Harris that up until a couple of days ago were both in NFL camps. So if that doesn't prepare you to be a really good defensive end, I'm just not pointing him out. There's a ton of guys, you know, all conference wide receivers that made you better as defensive backs or linebackers. So uh, those guys have grown through the years, and now it really is defensively. It's our time to shine. Do you have to stress to the young guys that even though they were part of that team that went, you know, to the championship game that, yeah, you were a part of it. You were there every day. You practiced hard every day, but you didn't do anything. <laughs> I can't say that they didn't do anything. They played, the field, a, they played a vital role in our preparation for us to be able to win all those games. But now it's their time. And it, it is a little bit of a, you know, I say an ice bucket challenge, a dump of cold water on your head when you've been in the locker room, you've been part of the system, you've been involved. But now it's your responsibility. It's different. It's different when you're the youngest child versus the oldest child. And when the oldest child gets out and the youngest child is now the only child, it's his responsibility to take care of everything. So it is the same thing. It's a growing and maturing process. And some of the guys have taken to it faster than others. But as we get closer to the first game, I feel pretty good about where they are. You've also said in the past that um, for you to play a true freshman, it's easier for somebody who's farther away from the football than somebody who's close to the football. I know you were raving about your class that you recruited this past year. Are we going to see many of your true freshmen play, or is your plan to try to redshirt as many as possible? Again, the plan is to redshirt. That is always the plan. That uh, you know, Picture yourself at 17 versus 22. Who's a better athlete? Who's a better football player? Who's a smarter person? Who's got more life savvy? So it's always the goal to redshirt these guys, but on occasion, they just don't let you. And I don't ever try to hinder them in this. If they work so hard and they're talented enough, I don't want to sit them on the bench and go, no, you're not old enough. If they can get it done and they're doing it better than anybody we got, then yeah, they're going to play. And the only way we're not going to play them is if somehow I feel like physically they just can't handle the war, that they're going to get battered and broken in a way that they shouldn't because they are so young. And in that case, I'll sit them down and go, yeah, you, you know what, you're the most talented guy we got at this position. But I don't, I'm not going to put you in harm's way this year. You need a year to grow and get stronger. So uh, with that being said, I can guarantee you that there will be true freshmen on the field this season. There won't be a lot, as usual, but there will be those rare cases of the guys that just don't give me a chance. When you recruit, do, do you or, or do kids ask you, hey, am I going to be able to play right away? Do you, do you say that you prefer to redshirt? Um, do kids know that coming in? Uh, honesty, complete and utter honesty. If, if we're not telling them the truth in the recruiting process, what kind of relationship do I expect them to have with us when they're here? So, yeah, well, I tell them the truth. I tell them the exact thing I told you that I expect to redshirt and try to redshirt everybody, that five years is a great growth time for a young man, that the first year in school and the transition from high school to college is one of the most difficult transitions in life, period. So trying to win football games with that guy in that period of time is really, really difficult. But I tell him, it's, I said, coaches don't make depth charts, players do. And my job is to win ball games. I got to make sure that these guys get an education, that they get out the door ready to make a difference, and then I win enough ball games that I can feed and take care of my wife and kids. So best player plays, they're no favorites, so it's what you earn, which is a good life lesson. It's what you earn. As Coach Ambrose and I talked before we went on the air, whatever he's feeding his children, it's working because they're <laughs> growing like crazy. When we return on the Tiger Football Report, we'll take a look at some of the student athletes that the Tigers could be expecting big things from in the coming year. The Tiger Football return, the Report returns right after this quick break. Virtual Wallet can help you be that person who's good with money. See what's free to spend, move money with a slide, save with a shake. Feel good about your decisions. Brian Vickers, Aaron's sponsored driver. He doesn't just love racing, he lives it. He got the paper! Woo! His pit crew follows him everywhere. Oddly, so does his boss. Right, right, sign that, sign that. <laughs> yeah! And his passion for racing is rivaled only by his passion for errands. No credit needed. I'll take it. Woo! Woo! 
Congrats. Aaron's makes owning easy through lease ownership, so you can own the life you want. You'll find it on the sidewalks of Little Italy and on the porches in Catonsville. You can see it when friends meet in Mount Vernon. It's pride, pride in our city, pride in our people. That's why MedStar Health is building the most accessible healthcare system in the region to look after everyone from Lutherville to Locust Point. So no matter where you go, no matter who you are, you're never far from MedStar. White Market's Ice Cream Plant is based in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, and it's locally owned and operated. We've been making our ice cream for nearly 50 years. We create roughly 70 flavors of ice cream right now. We use local ingredients, especially our cream, which is from our milk plant. The cream is what gives our, our ice cream a rich and creamy texture. Now together with our customers, uh, we've created a, a product called Peanut Butter Indulgence, which will be coming out this summer. It's a peanut butter ice cream with sea salt caramel swirl, chocolate covered pretzel. How could you go wrong with that? Personally, I love our ice cream. You come to our house at any given time, you'll find at least five packets of ice cream in our freezer. Uh, our kids grew up eating wise quality ice cream, and now we get to treat our grandchildren to it. It's been a pleasure for me to be tasting ice cream for over 40 years for Wise Markets, and uh, I'm loving every minute of it. Welcome back to the Tiger Football Report. I'm Spiro Marikas, joined by the head coach of the Tigers, Rob Ambrose. Coach, one of the biggest changes that fans are going to see this year, and it's only because of the position that, that everyone likes to talk about it, and that is the quarterback, Connor Frazier. Of course, we all remember the great drive he led the Tigers on against Eastern Washington, which led you to go to the national championship game. But Connor had to come into camp this year and win the starting job. What was it that set him apart from the other guys in camp? Uh, there's a million different things that got this done for him. Uh, but to be honest, it's the intangibles. It really is. He's, he's a great athlete. He's a good passer. He's a smart kid. But there's certain guys, guys that try to play quarterback, and then, then there are guys that are quarterbacks. And Connor is that. He really is. And if you go back in the history of his playing career, even to Little League days, he's probably one of the most decorated winning quarterbacks in the history of Maryland high school football. So. Having that guy at the reins, a guy that's seen the good and the bad, he's learned from some really, really talented guys, uh, it was kind of a eventuality that it was going to be him. Joe gave him a great run for his money. He really did. Joe, while I was very displeased with what we did in the spring at the quarterback position, uh, what's happened since the first day of camp has been thoroughly impressive. Connor's raised the bar for all of them, but Joe's been right there with him. And I, I can say, in complete honesty, if something were to happen to Connor, I feel much, much better about Joe going in the game and taking the reins. Many fans may not remember, but Connor was this close to being your starting quarterback last year. Well, see, this is true, that there was great competition, and he was actually the backup two years ago behind Grant. So, I mean, he's been sitting there waiting in the wings, and, and he's done it the right way. There are guys that sit there and go, I'm not the starter, and they sit on their butt and they don't work really hard, and Connor has prepared to be a starter for years. So really, when I say it's an eventuality, he just walked in, and when the, you know, he was recovering from shoulder, shoulder surgery in the spring, but when he got the green light to go, he just walked right in and took it like it was his. You let, you've talked several times in, in many of the question and answer sessions that you've had since the championship game uh, about how Peter Appens had one of the greatest mm -hmm. years of any Towson quarterback of all time, which is saying a lot because there have been a lot of great <laughs> quarterbacks here. Connor Frazier takes us back more to Grant Enders, though, than, than Peter did. And as great of a year as Peter did, there were certain things you couldn't do with him that you could with Grant, and I guess now you can do with Connor again. Correct. Uh, that Peter Athens, and, and this is no disrespect, I, I, I know personally a large amount of some of the greatest quarterbacks, I want to say that played here, that played collegiately in the state of Maryland. In the history of the state of Maryland, we probably have more of the best quarterbacks that have ever played in college than any other school, and I'm not offending anybody, this is just a fact. I mean, they're, they're amazing. Peter is one of the greatest passers I have ever seen ever, then that he could do things that would tear my hair out because I'm like, how did you get that ball in there? He, it just he, God gifted and he used it well. But uh, Peter, for love him as well as I did as a passer, athletically that was not his, his strong suit and him running around is a scary endeavor. So uh, watching Connor, who's, who's a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, a little more agile. I mean, he was agile enough to score a touchdown as a wide receiver against James Madison. So uh, having him out there 
and having his multiple aspects at our disposal has allowed us to open up some of the offense and makes us tougher to defend. The other guy that obviously big shoes, the most decorated football player in the history of Towson, um, a man who is the highest draft pick in the history of Towson, Terrence West, who went number three to the Cleveland, in the third round of the Cleveland Browns. His shoes have to be filled, but, but you've got a core of guys back there, including the CAA Rookie of the Year, to take his place. Yeah, this is, this is one of those things that people tend to, to bypass. They look at stats and numbers, and they don't look at the big picture. One, as good as Terrence West was, without that offensive line, those stats aren't showing up. You know, he's a really, really good football player, and there's a reason he's playing at the next level, and God love him. I'm, I mean, he's doing a great job for Cleveland. But that offensive line replacing them is it's very, very difficult. And how you know this is for the last three years, even if you go back to 11, when in the beginning of the season, Terrence wasn't playing. We were still running over everybody using multiple backs. Nobody had 100 yards a game, but we were still running for two and a quarter a game. We've built a scheme where we will be physical on offense and attempt to run the football and, and make a difference in the momentum of a game. And doing that requires having the right people in the backfield as well. Darius Victor is that guy. And uh, the two of them last year were a tremendous duo. If one stepped out, you would go, oh, Terrence is out of the game. Now we get a break. Oh, God, that guy's coming. You know, and he single-handedly knocked two people out of the first-round playoff game while he was running the football. I don't want to tackle him. I, <laughs> Darius Victor is going to be very, very good running back at this level. I have no question about it. And behind him is a transfer named Dante Ayers who came in from Rutgers and has done a really good job in a short period of time. So the one-two punch still exists, and we got some guys behind them too that are going to contribute. We go to the defensive side and the defensive line red, led by uh, John Desir, Ryan Dallaire. Great lot guys who played tremendous for you last year. The secondary, you've got Ty Smith, you've got Chris Carpenter, guys who were veterans that have played very well. You look at the linebackers, though, and there's going to be some names that people don't recognize. It's like, well, you know, you can't have everything all the time. And it's kind of difficult when you only got 63 scholarships. Losing Brighton Barr for the season was difficult. That uh, he brings so much to the table, not just on the field, but as a leader. And he's still doing that, but it's been frustrating for him. But what it's allowed us to do is grow some youth, play some young guys, and give the, a lot of different guys a lot of reps. And I'm going to fall back on Fred Overstreet. Fred Overstreet's the only linebacker we had that played all three positions during a game last year. And that's how smart and heady he is. So he can play anywhere all the time. There's a guy named James Sims, and I'm going to say that name, and you're gonna, you're, I'm going to say it first because you're going to say a lot during the year. He's a local kid. He's a Maryland kid. He's one of the fastest linebackers I have ever seen. I, and my concerns with him, especially last year, he, he came into school like 190, and I didn't know if he could put the weight on and keep it on. But he's done a really, really good job working on his nutrition, working on use, using his body correctly, paying attention to what he puts in it, how much he rests, basically becoming a Division One athlete. And uh, he has made he might have made the biggest strides from where he was at the beginning of the fall semester last year till now of any player on the team. Special teams, you kind of went to a kicker by committee for a while last year. How do we look uh, in, in the place kicking department? Well, in the place kicking department, you know, we lost, we lost two. Both were seniors and both did a tremendous job. They were a great one-two punch and, the, and they really allowed us for some consistency once we got it squared away who was going in the short game and having DJ knock some bombs later in the season. You know, that was big momentum changers for us. Uh, we've got a guy named Sam Hurwitz who right now has won the job as the kicker and he's done a fantastic job in camp. He was hanging around last year. He learned from the old guys as what to do and on occasion what not to do. So uh, he's, he's, we've put him in some pressure situations where basically the whole team was relying on him. If he missed, we're going to run. And he's hit it every single time. Well, we hope he's going to hit them all this year. When we come back on the Tiger Football Report, we will dive into the Tigers' week one matchup against the Blue Devils of Central Connecticut State. But first, let's take a look at this week's Tiger Tidbit presented by Under Armour. Did you know since 1993, Towson has opened the season facing Central Connecticut State twice, winning both times. The Tigers defeated the Blue Devils 42 to seven to start the 1993 season. Coach Ambrose's first year as a non-student coach and opened with a 20 to 10 win over Central Connecticut State in 2007. So what you got on deck? Skyfall, lean in, then some Pinterest. You? Twitter, Minecraft, and then some Hunger Games. Boom. Oh, you guys are all set, huh? Oh, yeah. 
New Amazon Fire Phone. It comes with Amazon Prime. Tons of cool stuff for no extra charge. Really? It comes with Amazon Prime? Yeah. There's so much to watch. I've been on this earth nine years. I've never seen anything like it. The new Amazon Fire Phone, with a full year of Prime included, exclusively on AT&T. Mariner Finance is a consumer finance company, so we offer personal loans. Mariner Finance is a great place to work. It's a great thing for anyone with the entrepreneurial spirit. Everybody in every office has an opportunity to achieve and grow. Be your own leader. Be a leader amongst uh, the fellow co-workers in your office. The training and development that we do at Mariner Finance is one-on-one. -on -one. Someone who has been there, done it, experienced it. There is no better feeling. Learn with us. Grow with us. Run with us. Brian Vickers, Aaron's sponsored driver. He doesn't just love racing, he lives it. He got the paper! Woo! His pit crew follows him everywhere. Oddly, so does his boss. Right, right, sign that, sign that. <laughs> yeah! And his passion for racing is rivaled only by his passion for errands. No credit needed. I'll take it. Woo! Woo! Congrats. Errands makes owning easy through lease ownership, so you can own the life you want. This is where the legends live, waiting for someone with better innovation. From the brand that reinvented the t-shirt comes the Under Armour Speed Form Apollo. This is our rocket ship. Welcome back to the Tiger Football Report. I'm Spiro Marikas alongside the head coach of the Tigers, Rob Ambrose. Coach, you and your team have not opened the season at home or on a Saturday since 2011 when you defeated Morgan State by a score of 42-3. to um, The Tigers have not lost a season opener at home since back in 1991. You're facing a Central Connecticut State team that's coming off a 4-8 season, but they're under a new regime, which always kind of creates some problems for a coach, doesn't it? I feel like year after year after year, it doesn't matter what day we open, we open against somebody new. There's either a new head coach or a new offensive coordinator or a new defensive coordinator. So it, it, it's difficult for the planning. You're, you're not completely in the dark, but you don't have all the answers either. So we decided that this is just going to be about us, how we play our game. Um, the good news is offensively and defensively, we're extremely multiple. The schemes that the offense sees every day from our defense are both odd and even schemes. Uh, the, the formations and the plays that our defense sees out of us are incredibly multiple, very NFL-oriented. So it gives us a great foundation to prepare against the unknown. And for their head coach, Pete Rosamondo, who's going into his first season, as we mentioned, he's going to look at your offense, and he's not going to know what to do because <laughs> you've got all new guys over there. This is true. That, uh, he would have to steal practice tape to figure out who he was going to face and what we might do. So, yeah, there's some unknowns for him as well. But, again, the, and you'll find this is a common occurrence, a common theme all across America this weekend. For the first game, really for the first game, it is about you. It's not so much about the opponent. It is about you doing things the right way over and over again that gives you a chance to win. If you're a Central Connecticut State fan, uh, their coach, Rosamondo, who just got there, is someone that they probably know because he coached at New Haven in Connecticut and went 42-13 and 13 with two Division II uh, NCAA appearances. So he's probably going to get this program together, which is good news for them. I really don't have any doubt about that, that where New Haven has come from in the recent past to where they are now is in direct relation to him. The, the, the success that he has created in that place, the buzz up there, and I still know enough people in Connecticut, they've really come a long way in a short period of time. And uh, I really don't, I don't have any doubt whatsoever that Central Connecticut is going to follow suit. Luckily for you, they're not in the CAA, right? <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Your other three non-conference games this year at West Virginia. Um, then you go to Delaware State and then play North, Car uh, North Carolina Central State. Um, what do you try to accomplish in these four weeks leading into your first game in the CAA against Stony Brook? I don't want to be trite or redundant, but the, the formula stays the same. That before you get to conference play, you're really trying to build something. That you, you, you got a month to prepare for your first game, but you're really preparing for a season, the steps and the bricks that need to be laid to build yourself so you can be a good football team in September, better in October, and really good in November as you get your chance to go play in the playoffs. So it's, it's building week after week. What you want to see in these games is what you want to see in practice. You want to see a 
progress. You want to see growth. You want to see building. So whatever we are Saturday, by the time we get to October 1st, we're better. And it's cleaner and it's stronger and maybe it's a little bit different and tweaked, but constant growing, constant positive movement. When you do your non-conference schedule, mm -hmm. what do you look for? And I know you've said that over the last couple of years it's become more and more difficult for you to schedule games. But do you look at maybe the way the coaches play and, and that you might try to find teams that do different things to try to help you uh, get accustomed to several different ways of playing defense or offense? This is an interesting question in that, to be honest, for the most part, I didn't have much of a hand in almost anyone that's been on the schedule so far. That uh, I, I might have had it. I had a hand in the Kent State game because Kent State was a MAC team that wasn't really that good, and they had an opening. They were going to pay us to go out there. I'm like, man, we might have a chance to get our first one. I went. Little did I know they'd be ranked 22nd in the country at the end of the right. year. <laughs> Way to go, Rob. So uh, you know, it's a little bit of what I'm handed based on who has availability, and it's down the road. This is an athletic director thing, but the standard is for you have to weigh the conference play and the out of conference play, and you have to weigh the 1A team. You're going to play a 1A team all the time. That money's going to go to the department. You're going to, and, and you know the percentages are that you're not going to win that game, but every now and then you have a chance to do it. And when your team is older and more veteran, you really have a chance to do it. So uh, going into West Virginia in week two, you know, that's a paycheck for us. It's not a hard travel thing. It's not something we're going to get home at 5 o'clock in the morning like all some of these other crazy trips we went on. And the other ones are you want to play good opponents. You want to play solid opponents that hopefully you don't have to travel too far to. And, in the, and you want to be able to win. In your out-of-conference schedules, this is in the planning stages, you need to win these games. When you get to the end of the season, and 2012 has shown us that it's not necessarily who you play when you come from a good conference like us, it's how many wins you have. And in 2012, seven wins, no matter how good we are, and everybody in the country had great respect for us, didn't want to play us, they didn't let us in the playoffs. And in the end, it's how many wins, do you, can you get enough wins to get in? And playing in our conference, which is a crapshoot. I mean, you know, we've been picked to be first in the conference before. We've been picked, picked to be Latin. Now, we're, when are we picked to be fifth? Yeah, I, th I thought this was hysterical. We were picked to be fifth in our conference and we we're picked to be in the top ten in the country. I don't right. even know how that happens. Yeah. So, but it shows the respect that the coaches in our league have for each other, that it, there's no room for error. And with the graduation of all our guys, they're thinking, eh, we might have a fantastic, may not be that same team anymore. So our conference schedule is so difficult. We need to gather as many wins we can on the front end of the season build and grow in our practice and our execution so we can play as good as we can against our conference and get as many conference wins as you can get. And, and here's the perfect example. If you go back to all the teams from the CAA, I think there's six different teams in the last 11 years that played for the national title. I don't think one of them won the conference. So they didn't get the automatic bid. It was the right. other teams. And we didn't win the conference last year. We went to the national championship. That just shows you the parity in our league is so disgustingly hard. It's, it's, difficult. So uh, you have to schedule smart on the front end so you can keep building without taking a beating, win your games, take your 1A paycheck and maybe you get the win out of that, but be prepared for conference play because it's a war. And unlike other conferences, by being in the CAA, as Rob mentioned, that strength of schedule will always play in Towson's favor. We have to take one final break, but we will be back with more of the Tiger Football Report right after this. Virtual Wallet can help you be that person who's good with money. See what's free to spend, move money with a slide, save with a shake, feel good about your decisions. You'll find it on the sidewalks of Little Italy and on the porches in Catonsville. You can see it when friends meet in Mount Vernon. It's pride, pride in our city, Pride in our people. That's why MedStar Health is building the most accessible health care system in the region to look after everyone from Lutherville to Locust Point. So no matter where you go, no matter who you are, you're never far from MedStar. White Market's ice cream plant is based in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, and locally owned and operated. We've been making our ice cream for nearly 50 years. We create roughly 70 flavors of ice cream right now. We use local ingredients, especially our cream, which is from our milk plant. 
ice cream is what gives our, our ice cream a rich and creamy texture. Now together with our customers, uh, we've created a, a product called Peanut Butter Indulgence, which will be coming out this summer. It's a peanut butter ice cream with sea salt caramel swirl, and chocolate covered pretzel. How can you go wrong with that? Personally, I love our ice cream. You come to our house at any given time, you'll find at least five packets of ice cream in our freezer. Uh, our kids grew up eating wise quality ice cream and now we get to treat our grandchildren to it. It's been a pleasure for me to be tasting ice cream for over 40 years for Wise Markets and uh, I'm loving every minute of it. This is where the legends live. Waiting for someone with better innovation. From the brand that reinvented the t-shirt comes the Under Armour Speed Form Apollo. This is our rocket ship. Welcome back to the Tiger Football Report. Coach, thanks for stopping by and we wish you the best of luck this week against Central Connecticut State. Thank you and I hope to see you and everybody else out there making all kinds of noise. We will all be there. As we have mentioned, the Tigers take on the CCSU Blue Devils on Saturday inside Johnny United Stadium. If you can't make it to the game, don't worry. We will have it for you live and for free right here on the Towson Sports Network as well as on CBS Radio's 1300 AM. Coverage starts on the Towson Sports Network at 530 and on 1300 at 545 with kickoff at 6 p.m. So be sure to watch and listen as Ron Meehan, Zach Maskovich, and myself bring you all of the action Thanks for watching another episode of the Tiger Football Report. Once again, I'm Cyril Marikas, and we'll talk again real soon.